Eddie Linehan here, and uh, this time around, considering that Women's Day is coming up, it might be nice to not alone give a mention, but concentrate on the women in Irish folklore, because, by the Lord, there's plenty of them, between the good and the not-so-good, the tough and the gentle, the weak and the strong. Irish folklore is full of them, from ancient times to modern times. Now, there are so many, in fact, that we can only give a little sample. And considering that I'm living here in County Clare, I decided that... Well, let me start. There was the good, and of course that was Biddy Early. And Biddy Early, I've mentioned before, a wonderful woman, a woman who was a banfasa, a curing woman, who helped thousands, thousands, thousands of people, put their minds at rest, put their bodies at rest, and helped many people when they had trouble with the the good people. The fairies, call them what you like, the other worldly. But <laughs> there was somebody else that sticks in my mind always, and that was Mara Rua, the famous Red Mary McMahon. Now, she was a tough woman, and tough women, well, they were needed in the age of Cromwell. How many men at that time managed to hold on to their lands. Irishmen, not too many. You'd want to be a mighty, tough and cunning person to hold on to your lands in the time of Cromwell. And that applied in England as well as in Ireland, I tell you. Cromwell and his boys were a tough crowd of cutthroats. <laughs> and they surely were, and well remembered for that even to this very day. Uh, not everybody might uh, agree with me in that, but uh, many Irish people would. Uh, English people, well, Cromwell got what he uh, <laughs> was looking forward to when King Charles was, uh, we'd say, re-elected. But in Ireland, it was a different story entirely. Uh, Cromwell and his son-in-law, Ayrton, and his other generals, well, they give the Irish people a fair doing. And you'd ask yourself, how could a person like Mara Rua uh, hold on to her lands if Irish men couldn't do it? Well, first of all, who was she? She was Mary McMahon, and she was born in Clander Law in West Clare. And by all accounts, she was a good-looking lady, a good-looking young woman, and a good-looking red-headed, fair fair in other ways too. And because of that, there was always a queue of men up to the castle door. Her father was a pretty well-off lad. And uh, a queue of young men up to the door pestering, could we have her hand in marriage? Could we have... And, and uh, of course, she could pick out who she'd like. And the one she picked out was a man of the Nalands. Uh, she married him. He wasn't too poor, of course. Maura was always... Uh, she always had a good eye for something that would lead her up in the world. And, uh, well... They were married, but he didn't live too long. We don't know why, but he didn't live that long. And, well, she married again, she married again. And who did she marry this time only? Conor O'Brien, <laughs> the heir to Lemina Castle. Uh, Conor, like a lot of men of the time, he wasn't too bright. <laughs> he wasn't able to spot the way uh, politics were going. Out he went. Uh, picked the wrong side in the Confederate Wars of the 1640s. That They were the wars, of course, that the Cromwellians were involved in. And he actually fought at the Battle of Inchicronan, which is just a half mile down from my back window here. Fought at the Battle of Inchicronan, got a desperate wound there, and was brought home to Lemina Castle. And there happened the famous episode. He was brought home with that terrible wound and when they arrived at evening time himself and his soldiers, what was left of them, they came to the castle gates. Mara had the castle barricaded at the time. Tough woman, tough woman. They were, came to the gate and Mara looked down from the battlements. We want no dead men here, said she. <laughs> and of course, uh, hidden dead yet, hidden dead yet, Mara, but he will be if we don't live us in. No, in fairness to her, uh, she did leave them in. But the poor man, even though she tended him, he died later that night. Now, Mara, 
after that mistake of her husband, she knew that uh, if she wanted to hold on to her land and the castle, there'd be a retribution following his mistake. So she knew she had better do something very quick, and she did the following morning, early. She dressed herself in her best clothes, got her fine stallion out of the stable, and, with her servants, straight down to Limerick, which was the headquarters for General Ludlow, one of Cromwell's generals, straight down to the castle, John's castle, I'm sure, and and at the gate, oh, when the guard saw this fine-looking woman, they left her in, never suspecting who it might be. Uh, I suppose people judged by your clothing that time. And she faced General Ludlow, oh, she wouldn't go into bow and scrape before anybody, faced him and said who she was, and said, my lord, she said, uh, give me my lands in safety and I'll marry any one of your... Uh, <clears throat> looked at him, officers, <laughs> officers, she called them. And, he, you know, he was taken by her. He was taken by her. Because after weeks and weeks in this cursed, damp, miserable country called Ireland or something like it, he was sick of the natives with their gap-tooted smiles, all bowing and bowing and kneeling before you, and then stab you in the back when they got your back turned. And here was a woman now who was straight forward. Good, he was taken by her, and he lined up a group of his officers up by the wall, and he said, right, there they are, between high and low and good-looking and not so good-looking, and she made her choice, walked down, walked down, mm -mm, looking them up and down, of course, looking for the men that she might be able to manage. She picked one of them out, and mm, they were married there and then in Limerick. And off the wind, bye-bye, back to Lamina. No, we're not sure what happened. We're not sure what happened. But within a couple of days, Jesus did to his mother. I, no, it was probably the comfort of the, the castle. His mother in one of the pillars. It, no, it was probably a man that wasn't used to the campaigns. You know, soldiers, tough campaigning conditions he wasn't used to. Pillows and lovely feather ticks like that. His mother, one of the pillows, he was found in the morning with a pillow over his head. Mara Ruan, <laughs> poor woman, she was oh, heartbroken. But, you know, she, she had to go back to Limerick. She had to go back to Limerick, look for another husband. And she did, with her servants. And the servants were edgy now, you know, what kind of a reception would they get? Anyway, they were let in. And she looked at uh, Ayrton and she said, give me a right man, give me a right man. He was a bit of a softy, that fellow. He wasn't able for the, the, the conditions of the castle. Give me a right man. Hmm. He lined up another group of officers and uh, she picked out another one. Hmm. Fine-looking man, fine-looking man. They were married again and off back to Lemina they went. Fine, they were there for a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, and uh, it was, things were getting on fine, it seemed. But this particular morning, Jesse was shaving himself. You know, the old roundheads, they were great men to keep their hair short and keep themselves shaved. Not like the Irish. The Irish were a very shaggy crowd. <laughs> you wouldn't know them from bears. But he was shaving himself this particular morning, and Jez didn't raise a slip. Oh, Lord, the razor slipped. And you know the edge that was in them old, old cutthroat razors? They were like a sword. They were like a sword. Oh, gee, the blood, the blood. Oh, God almighty, the blood all over the place, splattered around the lovely whitewashed walls. And uh, the funny thing, Mara was giving out to him, and he bleeding to death. You were ruining the place. God almighty, will you stop bleeding? You were destroying the place. God almighty, what do we do? And by the time a physician was called, I'm sure there wasn't a drop of blood left in him terrible tragedy entirely. She collected her servants and back she went down to Limerick and by the Lord she was bound, bound this time on vengeance. She went back to Ireton in and she attacked him. She attacked him. And on my, she said, what kind of officers have you at all? Give me a right man. Give me a right man, she said. Oh, God almighty, she said to him. Look, if you expect to conquer Ireland with softies like that, she said, you're making a terrible mistake. Poor old Ayrton, poor Ayrton, he said, oh, God almighty. He lined him up, but he said, this is the last time. 
please, this is the last time he said I won't have an officer left if this goes on. She picked out another one. Cooper was his name. A cornet. Uh, in the garrison of Limerick. She picked him out and you could see the man cringing. You could see the man cringing. <laughs> but she picked him out. They were married. And off, off, back. Now, this man, this man, he was a bit different than the others. Great horseman. And, of course, I suppose he wanted to keep out of the castle as much as he could. <laughs> out he'd go every single day. Galloping, 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 exploring his new, new possessions. And Maura was at home, watching him as he ride out of the castle every morning. And she said, mm, this man, he could be dangerous. He'd be getting to know the place too well. And one of the days she said to him, I, I suppose you think you know the whole place. Well, it's a fine place, he says. Is there more to be seen? Oh, <laughs> more to be seen, says she. Ah, we have more property over near Mohor. Mohor? What's that, he says. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I'll show it to you, she said. Oh, there's fine scenery around Mohor. And the following morning, out at the back, of course, was the stable, with her two beautiful white stallions that she had trained with her own hands. They were tackled up, and on they went back west towards Mohor. Now, it was a lovely morning, a lovely spring morning, with the wind in their faces. And when they came to Mohor, you know those cliffs, 700 feet high? Your man, he had never seen anything like them in England. Not a chance in the wide earthly world. Next parish, America, out, out west. And he was there fascinated. And he was riding along the edge of the cliff when all of a sudden Mare gave a, whistle, a little whistle and the horse, the stallion, I suppose, used to every command from his mistress, reared up through Cooper and down he went, down 700 feet, down into the Atlantic Ocean. He would never heard of again. Well, now, <clears throat> Mare was her own mistress. <sighs> No fear the Cromwellians were going to come near her, no. <laughs> they might have an army, but she was her own mistress. She was tougher than any army, and they knew it. They steered clear of her after that, and she was her own mistress and left in peace and quiet for several years after that, looking out over all her possessions in peace and quiet from a big rock up the land, which even to this day is called Mara Rua's Chair. Anyway, she had a son, of course, but, but, after a while, she got sick of that. <laughs> and she got sick of something else as well. O'Loughlin, the Prince of Burn, started to pester her and pester her now that she was single again, to marry him and marry him and marry him and thought that she should. And she got sick of him. And she said, all right, all right, I'll marry you. I'll marry you on one condition. <laughs> that you'll ride that stallion, one of the stallions behind, uh, that you'll ride him as far as Mohor. Innocent man, innocent man. <laughs> he was a proud, of course, proud, one of the O'Loughlins of, uh, of Burn. Oh, thought he should be able to do anything that a woman, a woman ordered, a woman? <laughs> he was a man, a man. And this particular day, here, well, he... <laughs> He didn't quite do it because she insisted, oh, oh, no, you're not taking your own saddle. I have a saddle that uh, my horse is used to my saddle. And she saddled up the horse, but the girth was good and rotten. <laughs> she saw to that. And, oh, she was there. She was there on the other horse. And back they went to the cliffs. But when they came within sight of the cliffs, she <laughs> whistled again. And by the Lord, <laughs> the gift broke, and this time, slightly different. The horse went out over the cliffs. Oh, Lachlan must have been a mighty horseman. Somehow, he gave a twist, and he escaped. The horse, it was, that went out over the cliffs at a place called Isle Brish de Cree, and it has that name to this very day. Well, Mara was beside herself with rage, her beautiful horse, gone. But your man escaped. 
But yet he didn't, he didn't bother her again. And when he saw what he was up against, ah, the sweat that broke out, the cold sweat, and then the lucky man that I escaped. I tell you, nobody else bothered her after that. But finally, as I say, her son and herself, when the son grew up a bit, uh, she had the son by the earlier husband, they decided they'd move out of that place down to Drumoland. It was nearer Ennis, it was nearer Limerick, it was nearer the law courts, it was nearer civilization, better land and all that. And while the big house below Drumoland was being built, she supervised the building herself. She'd go down every day on the other stallion. But there was one small little problem. There was a little bohan of a house and a widow living in it on the way of the building. And, of course, the foreman came and he said, Mara, what'll we do with this lady? What? What do you mean, what'll we do with her? Clear her out of it, of course. A, a bloody thing like that, standing in your way, clear her out of it. But but she's a widow, ma'am, ma- 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 we can't, we can't. If you can't, I can. And Mara went and told the lady, if you're not out of that this evening, you'll be out of it tomorrow in a different way. And she shot her horse whip out, she said. And when the old woman wasn't out of it the following morning, what do you think Mara did? Only whipped her with her own hand. And the poor old woman, you should never bring a widow on yourself. The poor old woman got down on her knees and she made that famous curse that's remembered even to this very day. That hateful Mara Rua may die with her neck stretched between earth and sky. But Mara, <laughs> she only laughed, oh, oh, and then whipped her across her back. And then she said, no, she said, that's what I think of you and your old gibberish. Out of it. And she said to the foreman, if you don't clear this before this evening, pointing to the old shack, the old, the, the old, whatever you want to call it, the widow's little bit of a house, you'll get the same. It was cleared, and the widow was cleared out of it. But, like I say, Mara should maybe not have brought a widow's curse on herself. Or oh, the house was finished. We don't know what happened to the widow. But a little while after that, when she had moved into her brand new place, she was on a hunt just below Clare Cashel, at a place not near, near Clare Cashel, about a mile beyond it. It's now called Carnelli. But... She was there, they were hunting a fox, and she was booting it out, out, out in front of younger men, 20 years younger than herself. Lord bless us, she was getting younger and younger, it seemed. But out she was going when the wind blew her scarf out over her head and frightened the horse. And all of a sudden, he reared up, threw her back into the fort branch of an oak tree. And when the rest of them came up, there she was, hanging, struggling, and her neck broken. Dead as a rat. Dead as a rat. They took her down, of course, but there was nothing she could be done about it. She was dead. And there was the widow's curse fulfilled. When others couldn't kill her, when Cromwell or Ayrton or any one of the others couldn't get rid of her, a simple thing like a widow's curse. And they say that... The stump of that old oak tree is still there today at Carnelli, the big long driveway into fine Carnelli House, just a mile below Clare Castle. There it is. And by the Lord, <laughs> nobody has ever interfered with it because they say her spirit is still confined in that trunk to this very day. In an age like ours, when you could believe, if you were to believe the media, that there's a constant war between the sexes. <laughs> if you look at Irish folklore and legend and myth, you'd find something else. You'd find that there are plenty, plenty strong women. In fact, Irish lore is full of strong women, Queen Maeve and others like her, down to the time of Biddy Early. Strong women, tough women, good women, women who taught men a lesson, uh, women who pointed out men's stupidity and the futility of many of the action of men. There would be men of a high order in their own minds who had to be, as I say, taught a lesson, but there would be men at a very local level 
who also had to be taught a lesson in a little way, the foolishness pointed out to them. And very often, of course, that was left to mothers to point out sons' stupidity to them. Now, we all know that Irish mothers were blamed for minding their sons too much and leaving them helpless and all that. I'm not so sure that that was entirely true. I think mothers in Ireland, they did a good job by and large because if the same job was left to fathers, um, I'm not so sure would they be able to do as good a job as Irish mothers did. We'll leave that for another day and for another time and let other people make up their minds about it. But the story I'll tell here, well, it tells of a son all right and how he learned his lesson. In the parish of Crusheen in County Clare, where I'm living, there are several castles and the remains of castles. Tough times, tough times, <laughs> remembered. But one of those castles was built by the McNamaras in the 15th century. Most of those castles, tower houses really, were built in the 15th century. And they passed through lots and lots of owners. But when time settled down, almost within living memory, this happened. One of the owners, an important man in his own mind, he was a prosperous enough man, he decided that it was time to, this old castle, time to put an end to it. It wasn't needed anymore. He was building a big, big barn. A prosperous man, like I said. And one of the families that he had working for him, there was a boy in that family. Fine lad, fine lad. He had finished his schooling. He was about 17 or 18 years of age. And, of course, looking for a man's work. And... The owner of the place said, Right, we need stones for the walls of this barn we're building. You're the man that'll do the work. The boy was delighted. Oh, as I said, man's work, man's work. And the following morning, he started. The masons were there, and they had used up all the stones that were convenient. Where did he... Well, <laughs> where did he... He was looking around, where would he get the stones? And where did he go? Up to the castle, with the crowbar, and he started rooting. Now, <laughs> he went to the convenient ones first, around the door, and he took out the nice, nice cut stones around the doorway. He couldn't get out the window ones, they were high, but he took around the doorway. And from there, he started burrowing, burrowing, burrowing into the walls, never thinking that there was 70 feet of castle above him. He wasn't maybe too bright, I don't know, but maybe, as I said, trying to prove himself a man. And of course, the masons, come on, come on, come on, more stones, more stones. There were two or three, and they were building the walls of the barn. But he was burrowing and carrying, and burrowing and carrying, and coming and carrying, and going on. But he was getting nearer all the time to the cornerstone of the castle. And of course, if he took that out, <laughs> down would come the whole thing on top of him. Now, maybe it was look. Or maybe somebody said to him, I don't know, I live be. And what he did then was he started burrowing down instead of on. Down and down and down. And taking the stones down until he got to the foundation. And then he started down beyond the foundation. Down three or four or five feet until he was down the hole. And then all of a sudden he came to this this flat stone and when his bar struck it there was an echo <laughs> and of course like any Irish man that was ever born hmm, a flat stone with an echo hmm, there must be treasure buried under it so I bid the lad he tried to uh, find the edge of it to lift it up to root it out but by the lot he couldn't find the edge of it whatever whatever way it was put in but then all of a sudden, whatever look he gave up out of the hole, now remember he was about four feet down and down on his knees, trying to root this. He looked up, and there above at the edge of the hole was this tall woman dressed in white. 
Now remember, this was in the middle of the noonday. You'd say something if this was in the gloom of the evening or in the night, but it wasn't. This was in the middle of the day. And there she was looking down at him with dark eyes. And of course he struggled up, struggled up onto his, uh, 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 onto his feet. And out came her hand and struck him across the face and down he went into the hole and jumped up again. Gone. Gone. No one there. But all he saw below him, out of the confusion, was the masons. Come on, come on, where are the stones, where are the stones? Well, by God, I can tell you this, he delivered no stones, no more stones. Only got a hold of his face as she had struck him and ran for home into his mother. And holy God, what happened to you at all? She saw the mark on his face and blood beginning to flow down his cheek. And there was confusion in the house. Now, his father was out, but his mother was there. And the poor fellow, he thought on his shoulder, trying to explain what had happened. She couldn't make head or tail of it. All she did was to try to dress his face as best she could. He did no more work that day. Father came back. Explanations were made. And of course, of course, it was the case of Holy Lord God, why didn't you leave the place alone? Didn't I tell you, didn't I tell you to leave that castle alone? And of course the father was talking gibberish. So the father had sent him up there in the first place. The mother, it was, that had told him to leave the castle alone. Huh? The mothers, of course, will talk sense where fathers will talk nonsense. Huh? But, of course, I suppose you can't blame the father because, you know, he was only a tenant. He was only a tenant of the big man and he had to go along with... Mm, to do, do what he was told in order to keep a roof over his head and all their heads. So, anyway, the boy, the boy was getting worse and worse. I don't know who finished the job or was the job finished at all. I'd say it wasn't because if you go along to that castle today you can still see the masks at the corner where the hole was and where the stones were took out. Anyway... Time went on and he was getting worse and worse and worse and he wasn't going out. And he was the kind of boy, you know, that before that he'd go out dancing, he'd go out playing cards. He was a very sociable lad, all changed. He went into himself and he'd be there sitting by the fire, gloomy, 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 and rubbing his face and rubbing his face. And there went a doctor, two doctors, ten doctors, even though they could very, very badly afford the doctor, and every doctor examined him, they could find nothing wrong with him. They said, are you sure that didn't his head is bothering him? Maybe he's gone slightly wrong the head. Uh, and you know, that was a thing that wasn't like to be said at the time, that you were maybe not correct in the upper story. You know, it, it was a kind of a stigma. But anyway, anyway, he was getting worse. And the local boys, his friends, they were at him. You know, come on, come out for the game of cards. It'll make you forget whatever is wrong with you. And this night, two of his best friends, they carried him out over the hill up to Derry Ulk, where there used to be a great card game at this particular house. He played, you know, a sort of played. He spent a lot of the time by the fire talking to himself. And even though they, they, they did their best for him, yet you get tired of, you know, when a card game would be going on, you get tired of a fellow like that. And the game went on. And they came home early because he ruined, he ruined the game for them. And they were coming down over the hill it all planted by the forestry now in the same place. It was a lonesome kind of an old place and they were coming down over the hill when he stopped. And the boys noticed him missing. He was falling behind them and they looked back for the bright enough night and they saw him talking, talking as if he was talking to somebody and they came back and they said, Paddy, Paddy, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> She's there, look, look at her, look at her, look at her watching me. And they looked around, and sure, there was no one there. And they said, Dash, what are you talking about? There's no one there. No, no one did yes, look at her watching me. And they caught him by a hand each, and they, come on, come on. They carried him home and brought him in. And he all the time, looking behind him, in pure terror, there was a sweat out through him. They could see it by the moonlight. And they brought him in to his father and mother, and they said, hey, you better do something with him. And they explained about him watching some, someone, some, her, her. And they said, we saw no one. It was time to do something. They made inquiries, took him to another doctor, who told them that there was this right doctor below in Limerick, a specialist, who could cure 
more. He had cured many people. Now, they didn't know what kind of a specialist was he. Shortly afterwards, a couple of days afterwards, they got out the Hurston car and down they went, down to Limerick, by the old road, down by Six Mile Bridge that time. I suppose it took them four or five hours, but down they went anywhere, and by the time they got there, they were hungry, and they went into an eating house before they go up to the specialist's house. And while they were there, waiting for their meal to come, there was poor Paddy, and he there, and he <coughs> rubbing his face, rubbing his face, like a man with bad toothaches. And I suppose he had, after the belt he got. But there was a man sitting at the next table, watching all of this. And he leaned over, and he said, Tell me, young man, he says, there's something wrong with your teeth. And Paddy only turned in and said, And the father caught hold of him. And he said, Hiya, he said, We always taught our children to be civil, and will you answer the man right? Or shut your mouth entirely. And the man from the next table, sh -sh -sh -sh, he says, Hiya, hiya, hiya. There's something wrong with that boy. And the father explained what had happened. And the man, he was quiet for a minute. And he says, look, he says, I'm from the county Tipperary. And down where I'm living in Tipperary, he says, we had a couple of instances of the same thing. And I'm telling you now, you're only wasting your money going to that specialist. He'll do nothing for you. If you'll take my advice, go down there to the Franciscan church. There's a priest there, and he named him Father. And if anyone can do anything for him, that boy... That priest will. They thanked the man. And they did go down to the Franciscan church. And they saw the priest. And he listened. And he said, uh, 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 he said, if you take my advice, send that boy to America as fast as you can. Because if he stays in this country, she'll kill him. I can give him my blessing. It might lessen the pain in his face and take it away, but she'll keep coming after him until she'll kill him. She'll drive him out of his wits and she'll kill him. Send him to America, and by the time he has crossed the ocean, he'll be all right. She can follow him there. They thank the priest. They put their hand in their pocket to pay him, but no, 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 no. He took no money. The Franciscans wouldn't do that. They got the money together for his fare to America. I suppose the neighbours helped because they weren't they weren't rich people. They took him down to Queenstown, Cove. They put him on board the ship, and the last thing they said to him, safe journey to you, God be with you, and write us a letter and tell us how you got on. They said good luck to him. Came home. And two months later, a letter came. The first letter they ever got from America. And when they read down through that letter, <laughs> what did he say? That he was only halfway across the ocean. I suppose one of the officers told him on board the ship that we're halfway, should they know, he wouldn't. When the pain left his face, and by the time he arrived over in America at Ellis Island, he was fine. And that boy, afterwards in America, he got married in America, had a family in America, and later he died in America, an old man. But the one thing was, he never again came home to Ireland, because if he did, who would be waiting for him? Herself. She'd kill him. She'd kill him. Because of what he did, that stupid act there at the castle, whatever was under that flagstone, he had no business interfering with it. Maybe it was something belonged to her. We don't know. We don't know. But it was a hard lesson to learn. A hard lesson to learn. And isn't it an awful, awful pity that an awful lot of our politicians and the likes of them today wouldn't be taught a lesson like that? <laughs>